All right. Well, I was not going to do a video day. Well, actually, originally I was going to do a video today. I wanted to try to do one every Friday. And I was going to have Josh Hensley join me, um, who is a developer who's played around a lot with um, Bitcoin, a lot of uh, tokenization stuff, wallet stuff. And we were, we were going to discuss some of these tiny payment ideas and realities. But last minute, I canceled on him because I was not feeling very well. And uh, I decided to take a nap. And I took a nap instead, and got up and had some homemade bone broth uh, that my wife makes. I'm telling you, that stuff is the bee's knees. Um, and felt a little better, good enough to, to hit record and just get a short one out there so that I'm, I'm kind of a uh, consistency freak. And I want to sort of see if I can keep this going on a weekly basis as much as possible. Um, so I wanted to just briefly touch on a few things that were not mentioned in the last video. Because this series is about tiny payments, we're not really focusing on other attributes of Bitcoin or blockchain or crypto technology. Um, some of those come into play, some of the business models discussed, even some of them that I mentioned before, like, uh, you know, like revenue streams that can be tradable, um, you know, that involves tokenization and some things that are a little beyond just the ability to make tiny payments. Um, but some of the other attributes, I want to just briefly talk about because, you know, Bitcoin, blockchain, we'll just say crypto. I don't really like that phrase, but I'll just say crypto. It refers to Bitcoin and all of its forks and any other, you know, theory, like proof of work, proof of stake, coins, projects made. Not all of them are created equal. Some of them don't work at all for some of these things or all of these things. Um, but when I say crypto, that allows me to also refer to things that I don't know about um, that may have some of these attributes and I just haven't learned it or things that may emerge yet in the future. But the basic building blocks ushered in by Bitcoin when Bitcoin was introduced. Um, and by the way, when Bitcoin was introduced, it had infinitely more technological capabilities than BTC has today, uh, you can think that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I think in embedded in that first version was so many things that other chains are trying to do, smart contracts and all these other things, um, were kind of part of the original, if not vision, certainly capability set, um, which I think is kind of cool. Anyway, so what are some other things outside of tiny payments? And, and you may be one of those people that's like, I don't care about tiny payments. In fact, I had a few people email me like, I don't care. I don't think it's important. I don't think there's anything important about tiny payments. Um, you know, anything under $5, who cares? And again, as I said at the outset in video one, uh, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's what I will discover in this series, or maybe that's what the market will discover. I have a hard time believing that. Um, I think... For many of the examples that I laid out, there is a lot of potential. I mean, we just don't know, right? Because it has never been possible to, to put a money price uh, and to have actual transactions involved with anything under a few dollars. Um, we just don't know. And I think there's just so much untapped potential. Um, and I can certainly visualize many things that sound like great business ideas to me um, that may or may not end up being the case. But I think, it's, I think it's really exciting. But there are a lot of people who are like, I don't care about any of that. Why would you focus on that attribute of crypto? And there's a couple of reasons. So some of the other things, and I wrote an article, you can find it on Bitpost. Uh, it's called, what's left, wait, what's it called? Uh, yeah, what's left of the Bitcoin dream? And I wrote this maybe a year ago or so. Um, and you know, some of the attributes that I think many of us, myself included, find exciting about Bitcoin or crypto are things like being uninflatable being private, being outside government control, being uncensorable, being instant, being global, being decentralized, being immutable, being usable as money, and being able to do micro and nano transactions. Why from that huge list would I focus on micro and nano transactions, especially because I'm somebody who is a, a radical fan of human liberty. And I hate the tyranny and oppression of uh, the organized crime that labels itself uh, as government. And, and what originally excited me about Bitcoin when I first heard about it, I think I first heard people talking about it 
in like late 2011, but I first heard about Bitcoin itself specifically, like the idea of Bitcoin or somebody who'd come across it or heard of it maybe in late 2011, I think it was the fall of 2011. But in 2012, spring of 2012, I first was sort of introduced to it. And it was exciting to me for most of these reasons other than micro and nano transactions. I didn't really think too much about that component. It was a private money, a free market money that's decentralized, has no one central point of control, that's uninflatable, it's sound money, that's uncensorable. You can't stop someone from using it, from sending it one person to the next. It's global, breaks down all these artificial you know, uh, government uh, borders. Um, it's immutable, you can't go in and alter and change and manipulate the data. And the idea of being able to replace government money and have completely free market money that you know no one can shut down if they don't like political speech or products that you're buying are illegal. That was super exciting. Now, it didn't take me very long to realize that those attributes were uh, maybe oversold or, or maybe I just misunderstood them. I got too hyped. And the further I went, the more I realized that I think pretty much all of those are pretty severely oversold. And I think that's unfortunate. Like, I wish it were the case. I wish it were all of those things. Um, but I don't think most of those things are really, they're not fully doable. Some of them are to various extents, to varying degrees. Um, and then some of them are still kind of unknown. So like if we work down the list, uninflatable, I guess, but it's code made by humans and humans can change the code at any time for any reason under duress at gunpoint from governments. Um, now people could say, well, they changed the code and then nobody's gonna run that code. And then maybe, but there's another way, there's two other ways that it's not really so strongly uninflatable, maybe three. One is um, the fact that at least in the case of Bitcoin and BTC and in many other crypto projects, uh, many people are not actually using the coin itself because they have high fees. So if they have fees that are higher than fractions of a penny, frankly, it doesn't make sense to be constantly using them, sending back and forth. And so things like Cash App and PayPal and Robinhood and most of the, most of the places where people are getting and sending this to the extent that they are, they're actually getting and sending IOUs that those companies issue. That are like, yeah, 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 we got your, you know, you sent us your money, boom, you instantly have your Bitcoin. Congrats, you just bought $5 of Bitcoin on Robinhood or whatever, Cash App. And then you can send it to somebody. That hasn't actually happened. It hasn't actually cleared yet. You're trusting that they're doing that on your behalf. Now they could issue more IOUs than they actually have Bitcoin to back it. Who's, who's auditing? Who's paying attention? Now, hopefully there's some market mechanisms that would make that undesirable. But, um, and then there are things like Tether, which creates a ton of volume. And I want to get into all that, but incredibly suspicious activity. I mean, I mean, proven to be lying about being backed uh, in this case with cash, but the ability to move markets with sort of digital tokens that are not what they represent themselves to be is there. It's much stronger. You, you can't just be like, it's math. Math always wins. It's like, there's a lot of ways. Okay. And then another way that it's inflatable is sort of, the fact that you that there's so many coins right now, there's so many forks, you can fork it at any time, and then boom, you have a bigger supply. Now it's a different coin, uh, and so you could say, well, that's just a new supply. But there is a, a sense in which that reduces the scarcity component, and the fact that the the market can switch at any time, right? Like, well, if the market decides everybody likes using Dogecoin more than Bitcoin, then Dogecoin, my, my Bitcoin value decreases. And it's an, the fact that the supply of competing coins is trivially easy to increase means that the value retention properties that uninflatability has are diminished somewhat, not entirely. Um, so those are just a couple of ways uh, that I think it's, you know, again, 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 just a straight up code change. Like, I absolutely see in that as being in the, in the cards, um, maybe even likely in the case of BTC, for example, if it is to survive long into the future as the minor subsidy runs out, um, 
saying we're going to re- we're going to raise the cap and the minor subsidy is going to continue. You're going to keep getting a block reward and we're going to keep creating new coins beyond the 21 million. Um, you know, I don't see that's out of the realm of possibility at all. In fact, I think in many ways it's, it's that or raise the block size very, very large so that transaction fees can be very, very, um, you can collect a ton of transactions, a uh, ton of fees for transactions. I think one of those is a must if Bitcoin uh, BTC is to survive, you know, past, maybe it's a really, maybe it's 80 years, a hundred years, um, but maybe it's not that far. It depends on the price. Right. So anyway, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways in which it's not just like a constitution is not something that's going to bind. Oh my God, it's written down now. Governments will never violate it. Thank God we got it written to the extent people believe in that written thing and to the extent it's unpopular to violate it. It is a, a kind of a constraint, but it's not an ultimate constraint. As long as people are willing to let you get away with it, same, same with code. People are willing to let you get away with code changes. Code changes will happen. So uh, there's that component. Um, private, yeah, kind of, but I think governments outside of government control, uh, no, I don't think so. I wish it was. Um, again, it's a constantly moving landscape. So some things are outside of government con- control and it's a constant race, but governments certainly have the ability to control frankly, any cryptocurrency, if they really had the gumption, had the incentive to do so. You could control the, the people who own the repository and contribute to the code. You could control the miners. You can control. Now, the beauty of it is there's this escapability hatch, right? Because anyone can fork off and do all these, you can have, you can constantly be running away from those government controls by sort of creating your own version or like a bunch of you and your buddies mining something on your laptops until they come and confiscate your laptops, right? It's a game of cat and mouse. But it's not like, aha, we're finally permanently outside of government control. It's not uncensorable for the same reason. Coins can be frozen. Uh, they have been frozen. Um, coins can be confiscated. Uh, governments can, can order uh, miners or, or devs to do different things, right? Like at the end of the day, violence is still in play because the code is written, maintained, and changeable by humans. Humans are manipulatable with violence. Governments have monopolies on violence. And when they so decide to apply it, they can you can't completely escape that. Again, it's like an additional set of potential escape valves. Cool. I love it. Like I love the, um, you know, uh, the ability to do that. Oh, the privacy component. Yeah. Privacy, uh, private Bitcoin is not private at all. Um, some coins like, um, you know, it's a public ledger by its nature. You can encrypt things, uh, and make it harder. You can do coin mixers. You can create things like Monero or Zcash that make it much more difficult. Um, like prohibitively costly to figure that out. Uh, I think one of the best ways to increase privacy is to have really, really, really low fees so that you can break up your transactions into tons of UTXOs um, that makes it, again, not impossible, but more costly, more difficult so that only a very, very motivated government or party would, would want to go through the, the time to trace back a transaction. But public ledger is not private, um, period. Uh, it's not encrypted either. You can add encryption. You can encrypt certain things within a transaction. Um, but, uh, you know, it is, it is a public ledger. Um, instant. Yes, it was to start with, and it is today on big block versions of Bitcoin. Uh, and it can be, um, that's definitely possible and and happening today. Global. Yes. Uh, with some exceptions. Um, I, I guess the exceptions are more just in the challenge, the difficulty of, the difficulty of access because on ramps and off ramps are basically all controlled and all have government regulations on them. It's very challenging to, to onboard large parts of the globe um, without having it be done where they're basically operating off chain through some bank, you know, owned or some, you know, messed up government controlled or at least heavily regulated exchange. But the possibility is there. Like you can, anyone in the world can, can, have a Bitcoin address um, and you can send them money. Decentralized data. Can you store, is, the, is it all decentralized? Because you got all these miners competing. Mm, sort of, kind of. And can you have the data, can you store data uh, immutably and in a decentralized way? So could I you know, upload like this, this blog post on BitPost here is on chain. It's on the Bitcoin SV chain in this case. And so you could say, well, nobody can take it down then. So like BitPost's, they can shut down or they could ban my account, but all my content is still lives on chain. And I can go anyone, I can go access it myself or anybody that wants to spin up a competing UI that lets me see all that stuff. Um, and that's really cool. But 
I don't think that that's like 100% bankable, right? So there's a couple like on the technical side, miners could decide to prune data at any time to whatever extent they want. Now you could say, well, if there's a real market for that, if the miners want to prune it, then, then another industry, which is like data warehousing, will come up and someone's like, hey, we'll archive and index all the stuff that miners are pruning. And then you can come, you know, you can come fetch it for a fee. Um, I think all that stuff's possible. I don't, I don't think that it's like, oh my God, this data, it's all going to go away. If it gets too big, nobody, the miners aren't going to want, no, nobody's going to want to, you know, maintain all this stuff. Who wants your blog post on chain? What a waste of space. It's not going to be held. It's not possible. I, I don't really buy that critique fully, but it is worth noting that just because a platform like a bit post cannot delete my content because it's on the blockchain um, and it's, you know, hosted in, in, in very, in, in various places um, wherever anybody is running that full node. Um, it doesn't mean that it could not potentially get pruned and removed. Um, it, it could. So that makes it not fully immutable. And it's, it's sort of decentralized, but it doesn't have to be decentralized. I mean, mining can central, I mean, mining is quite centralized now, frankly. I mean, Bitcoin, it's like, there's a handful of miners really that are like doing all the work. Uh, and they're the exact same miners for the most part on all of the chains, even the ones that all hate each other, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV. It's like, they all mine, not all, but many of them mine all three. They don't care. They'll mine whatever's profitable. It's not that many miners, um, to be honest, but it's got the ability to be de decentralized. And you can build other types of cryptocurrencies that have different difficulty algorithms that make it so that you know, everybody can always run it on their laptop or something. I, th I think that has um, very, very limited use, um, but it's like sort of possible. So anyway, there's a lot of things, smart contracts, really cool. Uh, kind of doable today in some limited ways on some different chains. Um, but I think a lot more complicated than a lot of people think uh, when they just talk about it. Um, a lot of the use cases for smart contracts are like no improvement over just existing contracts. Um, but I think there's something there. I think, it, I think it's pretty cool, the idea of self executing I mean, some of the ideas I talked about in the first video, like a like if I own a, a creator token and it automatically um, collects a, a revenue stream, like in some ways that is sort of a smart contract, right? The token is programmed to self-execute every time a payment comes in, it's getting split and whatever. You could put dates on it until, you know, for 10 years you get this revenue stream and then you don't or whatever. So the programmability um, is really cool. And that's a really legitimate, really awesome attribute. And some of these attributes I think are, re are really amazing and have a lot of potential, but the reason I came to the conclusion that almost all of them are oversold and not much has, has really gone forward in many of them, and many of them are not what they are, you know, first appear to be, unfortunately. I came to that conclusion and, and then was like, okay, what, what remains that right now today is currently possible? It doesn't require any future fixes or theoretical stuff getting solved. Right now today, that's possible because of crypto that you literally can't do any other way. So a lot of these other things that I mentioned, you can do other ways. Maybe, maybe crypto is a better way to do it. But what, what can you literally not do? Is there a business that you literally could not build um, any other way? And it comes down to me to tiny payments, micropayments and nanopayments. Now, there are some people that message me like, hey, you can do this today. You can go to some of these sites where you like take a, you do surveys and you get paid like pennies or whatever. Yes, to an extent, but you are, um, you are mostly, your, your payouts are not happening in real time. So you're getting lump sum payments, even if the activities you do are earning you pennies or whatever, they're not sending you a penny every time because the transaction costs are too high. They're waiting until it adds up to a, a larger amount and then they send you your payout. Um, you know, and there are, there are a lot of things that work that way. And so it, I still think it is a breakthrough. There are business models that are not possible under that, you know, technological setup that are when those payments can be instant. Um, and also reminds me of something I was chatting with somebody afterwards and they were like, yeah, I, I you know, I've never thought of micropayments or nanopayments as like necessarily the best thing when it comes to as a consumer, I don't really want to pay by the page for a book or by the minute. And as I said in the first video, that absolutely may be the case. Like there's a lot of stuff I'd rather just pay a bulk monthly charge. Even in those cases, it doesn't mean that tiny payments are not a potential breakthrough on the back end. 
even if the consumer is paying nine ninety nine a month for all the Netflix they can watch, the payments going to the creators on the back end being able to be instantly split and instantly streamed to them instead of these big bulk chunk payments that go to some production company who then has to make bulk payments to all of the various people that have some royalty percentage and then have to, and you got to wait months and months and months. I mean, you know, I had a friend that he like wrote a song that was used in, in like churches or something one time, like years and years before. And, you know, every once in a while, every couple months, he'd get like a check for, you know, $22 in the mail or something like that. Right. Um, and you think about all the, all the cost involved in that, that constant, these sort of bulking of these payments and just the ability to stream those out. And then again, to sell those streams, um, I still think is a breakthrough, even if the consumer facing component, not everything is going to, not everyone is going to want a micro payment or a nano payment as a consumer. Um, so I still think there's something there. So I kind of came to this conclusion, even from like a, you know, libertarian standpoint, how to make the world more free. I think a lot of people are like imagining that you just buy and hold Bitcoin or some other crypto. And then it like makes the state wither away and you're operating outside of the state and you're uncensorable and you're on, you know, that's all bullshit. You're not, I wish it was true, but you're not, you know, maybe using some privacy coins, doing some different stuff here and there. You can, you can, you can add, you can expand some freedom on the margins with some of those things for sure. And I think that's great. The more, the better, but focusing on this idea that like, oh, the fed's going to crumble because if we just buy Bitcoin, you're kind of following a pipe dream while you're ignoring a real, genuine, massive opportunity that is possible right now today that doesn't require anyone else to believe your belief. And it doesn't require two friends to buy and them to each get two more friends to buy so that it goes up in value. And so that blah, blah, blah. It doesn't governments putting it on their books and all this crazy stuff. The ability to have global payments down to fractions of a penny instantly all the time like what the opportunities that opens up the ways to expand human freedom and agency and wealth i mean the things i talked about in the first video in regards to changing the paradigm from i'm an employee i work for a company and they give me a paycheck to i am a value creator and i perform valuable activities and every time those activities are of value to someone else I capture some of that value in perpetuity. And then I have the ability to sell that value stream. And I have this portfolio of streams of revenue of the, the value that I can capture. That is a game changer. The ability for people in parts of the world where you know denominations of money that are relevant to them are much, much lower. Game changer, right? Massive, massive increase in freedom, autonomy, uh, individual, uh, personal, you know, liberty and, and wealth creation, um, standard of living, like that stuff is incredible, incredible. And that's a way to make the world more free right now and, and, and build and get your hands dirty and experiment with these business models. You know, one of my favorite um, thinkers, Ronald Coase, and he only wrote, like, I think he only published two papers and they're both like incredible, kind of like, you know, the most cited, whatever. Um, but one of them is the theory of the firm. And, and that's kind of what I'm getting at here is that, you know, the idea, the reason that firms exist is because transaction costs exist. And, you know, um, every time I need somebody else's expertise or skills or labor for something, if I have to go the information cost of the search cost of trying to find who's the right person, and then the negotiations, and then making that transaction, if I had to do that every single time, the costs are too high. It's easier to say, look, I know I'm going to need this a lot, whatever your skill is, graphic design. So I'm just going to pay you a salary, an annual salary or a monthly thing to just be on my team. And then you're just like on call and you can just do whatever. Right. And that's because transaction costs exist. That's why firms form. But there's a cost on the flip side that keeps firms from getting, um, you know, from the world just becoming one giant firm, for example. And that's agency costs. Right. So every time I do that, um, that person's interest is not perfectly aligned with my own. They've got, they've got information I don't have about, let's say, how difficult a task actually is. And they've got an incentive to inflate the difficulty of the task, for example. Or if I ask them to go out and find a contractor who can do some technical thing that I don't know how to do, they might go to a buddy who's not very good at it instead of somebody who's better. 
because they want to give their buddy, you know, some work. And I won't know the difference because I don't have that information. Right. And there's, so there's costs, you know, on that side as well. And the ability to remove those transaction costs as much as possible, it frees up so many more business models. The idea of the firm becomes something very, very different, um, which I think enhances choice and autonomy. doesn't mean companies are bad and they'll all go away. The market will figure it out. If people have more choices, they can decide if they want to be a full-time employee for some place for some set amount, or if they want to you know, earn on a much more granular level for some micro task that they did and then, and then sell that revenue stream somewhere else. Like that's just a powerful, powerful thing. So that's why I'm focusing just in this series, 100% on the tiny payments component component of, of Bitcoin, of crypto. Um, Cause I think it's real, it's here now. It doesn't require any changes in governments, in anything. You don't need to convince a bunch of people to be true believers. You can build businesses where they're using it without even knowing they're using crypto. Um, you don't need to sell, you know, like you can just start building really cool new businesses now um, that have massive, massive impact. So that's really exciting to me. And again, that's, that's why I'm focusing on it. And that's why I am going to do my best to not get into protocol, like, like wars over which is the best crypto, what's a scam, what's a, I want to talk about that stuff. I want to, I'm going to bring on some people to kind of compare and contrast which protocols can actually do tiny payments right now today, reliably, consistently. Um, how do they work? What are their challenges? Is anybody building on them? Some of them can theoretically do it. I mentioned Solana last time, but I, I don't really see anybody doing anything on it. Um, I mean, very few in general have anything being done in the micro payment space. And again, I mentioned before, you can make a bunch of money doing a bunch of DeFi stuff and whatever else. Like, I get it. I get why you wouldn't. Um, but I want to find out who's building what and how and why, uh, what protocols they're using. Let's compare and contrast. Um, and, uh, you know, what does it take? So I've, I've got a couple of people already lined up that I'm going to chat with um, on here. And Josh Hensley, I will bring you back on uh, since I just decided last minute to go ahead and make this now that I'm feeling a little better. I didn't want to, I didn't want to try to, you know, bust into your schedule again on such late notice, but um, I'll, I'll be, I'm excited to, to do some more on this, on this, but my, my main thing is I want to open up your imagination and, uh, and I want to find out if I'm crazy, right? Like, I can imagine a lot of really amazing things with tiny payments. Um, can you, and beyond imagining it, can we go find out where some of these are being done currently and what's happening? What's the results? Um, and I'm excited to do it. So again, if you have any ideas or anything for me, you can find me at Isaac Morehouse on Twitter. You can post in the YouTube comments. I don't, I can't promise that I'll read those, but uh, that's that. Sorry, this was um, just a bit of a last minute ramble and not the, uh, not the well-structured show that I had originally planned.